So we did all the review of the TrueNAS server. Now we wanna do some testing of the TrueNAS server. We've actually been doing this uh, for the last couple of weeks. I have been randomly unplugging, replugging it in, working the drives, loading data, changing configurations, and making sure that the failover works. So these are some of the failover tests, and we're gonna, you know, I did a lot of testing to make sure I understood how the system works, so any of the problems are, if there's a problem, I should say, with the system and not with the testing method or with my misunderstanding of the system. And I gotta admit, it's been very trouble free. Now, I will note, one, we had the technicians from TrueNAS help set this up. And that's something when you buy a TrueNAS that you get is help from their technicians on the setup, on the CARP failover. That way when you deploy this in your enterprise environment, there's no problems. Uh, second, it's really interesting to me how it works. And uh, it took a lot of discovery, but there's a lot of neat things I discovered about this. So it's been kind of a journey of learning and kind of amazement of how resilient it is. Now the usual things work like pulling the plug out and that's gonna create a status alarm to let you know that one of the powers uh, units have failed. No problem, that's kind of expected and that's common in enterprise hardware. But where it gets really interesting is how the failover between two motherboards that can both read a array at the same time, that's where things get really clever and how it does the failover while doing data transfers. That's really neat. And I'm gonna go and plug the power back in. Now also I wanted people to ask how loud this is. And so I figured the microphone is just at the edge of my fingertip here, it's running. You can have a conversation over this. Uh, it's also not a ton of heat. I mean, it's seeing obviously with all the hard drives and whether or not you go from solid or uh, spinning drives to solid states is gonna create a heat difference, but we have almost all spinning drives in there, except for the two on the bottom where you see the orange stickers. One set up for Zill and one set up for a cache drive. Those are both solid states, so they don't generate quite as much heat. But overall, really impressed with the resilience of this system, and it's been it's been kind of fun to play with and like see what happens when you unplug things, including uh, we're gonna cover what happens for a network failure and walk you through the process of when one of the motherboards loses connectivity on the network, what happens to the drives and your data in flight being written there. Uh, so a couple things I have set up is it's doing a file transfer right now and doing some load testing. You'll probably see some Lincoln lights up front here. And it's also, at the same time, uh, the dual failover is completely like in place and we're gonna show what it looks like for a live switch between these and show the process of how it migrates from over here to over here. And we also have an iSCSI running Windows in a virtual machine attached through the network showing what happens when you lose connectivity and it switches over to the other motherboard. And we're not using the Lua. I specifically wanted to do it with the virtual IP uh, versus if you are familiar with ICE because the Lua support would be, I can attach it to both IPs at once, the individual IPs instead of the virtual IPs for the failover. So that's the test mode we're gonna do this in. Uh, but this does support the Lua. So if you're doing ICE because you actually can set up multiple IP connections for it and one to each motherboard. So that is another failover option. But we're testing everything on the virtual virtual IP for the purpose of this uh, to show you what happens when a virtual IP fails. Now all this is over gigabit so we're not going to do any performance testing. I don't have any copper uh, 10 gig connections. I only have SFP and this particular model was shipped to me with copper 10 gig not a uh, RJ45 10 gig. I didn't have SFP on this particular model uh, so I'm not going to do any speed tests. So let's get into some of the testing and some of the details and show you what happens when we do things like pop drives out. For a quick basic test, we're gonna uh, pop a hard drive out of a live volume. Now, this is obviously not a real hardcore test, but it's to show you the resilience of the system running ZFS. The lights blinking are one contiguous volume. The ones not blinking is another volume, but nothing's really going on. And what we're gonna do is swap positions inside of here and show you that ZFS, one, doesn't care, only pauses for a second when there's uh, volume removed, so you don't really have any lost time there. Now that drive was removed and now marked as failed in the system and an alert was sent, but by popping the drive back into another slot, it gets added right back to the volume group. Now it doesn't matter what slot it goes into, it starts reabsorbing it and you see this is in real time. It's going to start blinking and there we go. It's blinking again and writing data as if nothing happened. These are one of the ways you can do it. Rearranging the hard drives is kind of neat because it doesn't involve breaking anything. So let's kind of dig into the system here and show you what that looks like. So I have 
one called Tank Zill and one called Tank Cash. Now, this volume has a Zill storage. We're going to talk about this in, in a few minutes. Uh, but this one has a Zill storage. This one has a cash storage. And so this is the arrangement of them. The one we pulled the drive out happened to be the tank sill storage. Now there's no errors on here now because when you put the drive back in, it actually will clear the air. So if it's a temporary error, it logs it, it alerts you, but it does not, it'll clear the error because, oh, look, everything's back. So you still see the status here as healthy inside of the FreeNAS system. Now let's talk a little bit about the arrangement of this. So you see this as IP address 192.168.3.249. We can also go to 245 and log in there, which will, and we'll show you the other one, 247. This one's on standby. This is the second motherboard. So the active IP is going to be 249. So the arrangement of this is 249 is our virtual IP address shared by the two instances, the two separate motherboards that make up the TrueNAS box. This one is the inactive, it's in standby mode waiting, and this one's the active one. But when you're logging in for a sense of what you always log into and what you point all of your shares at and your iSCSI target, I'm doing everything at 192.168.3.249. Now, it doesn't necessarily tell me which one I'm logged into is it doesn't really matter unless you look to the host name, one is TrueNAS and one's TrueNAS B. Now I've got them plugged into a unified switch to make it easier to show how things are hooked up and how things uh, work in here. So here's TrueNAS and there is TrueNAS B. So there's a 247 one and a 245 one that's logged in now. And here's where they're plugged into the ports, port one and port two. Now you can see port one, hardly any data going across here. Port two, lots of data, about 182 gigs went across here because I was dumping files back and forth. And this is where the iSCSI is actually connected, is here. And let me show you where the iSCSI is. Now this was running in the background while we were doing the test. This is a Windows, and I'll show you the storage. It says, you know, Win 10 Zen on uh, iDrive, and it was on this right here for storage. I'll double click it so you can kind of see how the storage works. 10 on Zill storage. And when we go back over here to Zill storage, it's an iSCSI target of .249. So just so you have an idea of the testing environment that we have set up, that both of these have these virtual IPs of, uh, or have real IPs of 245, 247, but through the failover system that is called CARP, it has a virtual IP of 249. So all you ever have to think about is just having the one IP address and you don't have to go, which one is it? It'll switch automatically between them. And that's the fun stuff that we're going to show how that works. This is really clever. So obviously taking drives out, like I said, kind of the boring way to do it. So what happens, and we're, we still leave this uh, running in the background. I still got file transfers going on. I got just a file copy from my local system to this system and data flow in here. So let's show you what happens with the file transfer and with the iSCSI running when we disconnect a port. So we know right now this one here on port two is active because we know this because of all the data going across. You can say unify switch port two, 245. So there's the active one. We're gonna open up a ping here. So there's 245 pinging away and everything's connected to it because it's the current active system. So here, this one's on standby. Now let's walk through the process of actually disconnecting it. So we're gonna go ahead and click on this port here. We're gonna to choose to disable this port. Apply, it's gonna take a second. And we stopped pinging. And when you stop pinging 247, which was the standby, it pauses, it's being elected now. And we'll refresh again. It takes a few seconds here. And now this node's active. There's about a six second delay. So it waits six seconds to see that one timed out and it switches over. Now let's go back over here. Because it technically is a different system, it does make me log back in. But as you can see, our storage still sitting there, the same even though we switched. We'll go in the background here. Here's my Windows 10, stayed running. I go to the console. It's perfectly fine doing what it did. Now granted, during those six seconds, there was a pause of data that was not going across the network. Things weren't working right, but it never disrupted my devices attached across the iSCSI, my file transfer in the background paused for just a second and 
the machine stayed up and running. This is kind of the resilience of having the failover with CARP and the dual motherboards. This is how it looks in action. So pretty much the system stays completely up and running without really any more than this slight pause and disruption. All right, so let's plug the network cable back into that particular one. So we'll go back over here. We'll go with the Unify switch and we're gonna edit this uh, switch and change it from disabled back to enabled. And it's provisioning that port right now. It's pinging again. Refresh the page on this. And now this IP, the 245, became the standby IP. So what happens when you're doing this is the system goes from one to the other. When the failover occurs, there's a pause while it holds an election essentially and switches over. But it does not switch back to that IP. Not, neither one is primary nor secondary to each other. You can see like the host name has changed to the TrueNAS B local. The two work in unison. So once failover is complete, and we can actually read it here, you can follow the whole process of everything that happened. It detects that it's missing, detects that there's a changeover, it begins the volume imports, importing tank cache, importing tank sill. So there's our uh, imports. Then service restarts complete, allowing network traffic, synchronizing, child process terminated, starting up, failover, event complete. So there was an alert sent, there's a failover, done. It works. And this is really cool because these are obviously the you know worst case scenarios is you know losing a network interface or losing a motherboard. So we're going to cover that next of what happens when a motherboard failure because this was a pretty nice handoff. We just disconnected a network cable. It goes, I don't see this no more, and it just failed over. So it's a less aggressive one. And we want to show what happens when you have a real failure. Now it's very not advisable while a machine's powered on to pull the motherboard, but Ideally, these are going to be in high availability environments where you can do things like that. You can actually say, I want to replace a power supply, no problem, but that's easy. A lot of enterprise stuff easily replace a power supply live. They slide in and out from the back. As long as you get access to the back, you can replace a power supply and stay up and running. But how many devices can replace a motherboard while you're doing it? That becomes really impressive because there's the ability for these to talk directly to all of the hard drives at the same time and stay in sync with each other is is a pretty industrial feat that works really well in here. So let's show you what happens when we remove a motherboard. So you can see that this is the active motherboard because it's blinking away. And this is the one that's currently assigned active. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna eject this motherboard, slide it out. Everything's gonna stay up and running. I still have a file transfer going. I'm still running iSCSI attached to virtual IP and it's out. So now that the motherboard's out, let's take a look. We do have to log back in. So I'm gonna log back in over here because I made sure to disconnect the active one, which is B. Now we're back on the one that's just called TrueNAS, not TrueNAS B. And without missing a step, here's our TrueNAS B we're logged into. Here's all the storage. Of course, we have a warning, uh, failed to check failover status with the other node, no route to host. So. We didn't just fail over this time. We realized we disconnected the internal parts of the failover because there's a separate network that runs internal besides the external visible network. There's an internal network that ties these two devices together to keep changes between the two free NAS boxes in sync with each other. So when a failover occurs, all the information is always the same. So if I make a change to a share, make a change to the way the storage configuration or any configuration change to the FreeNAS system, the internal network makes sure everything's synced up between these two devices. That way, if one of them fails, the other one can take over. So now we didn't just break the external network connection. We removed the whole motherboard on the one that was active and running. And without a beat, all of these drives still have all their data. The data transfers are going. And we're going to go back over here. Here's our Windows box. We'll open up Firefox. We opened up Google last time, so we can do some grinding and open something. But uh, the box is still working. Granted, it's not wicked fast, but you know, it works. And uh, here's this Firefox session running. Well, I actually said yes to something, so now Google's gonna or Windows 10 is gonna open up this. But you can see, other than the six seconds again that it paused. Between these, we're able to survive an entire motherboard failover 
in real time on this. That's just a really impressive setup for how this works. So once again, everything's up and running. And this is what you get when you get an enterprise grade system that can handle things like, you know, yanking a motherboard out while it's live. Uh, they gave me permission to do that. I asked them if that was okay to test this uh, when they sent me this unit. It's like, you care if I pulled a motherboard out in real time? I mean, I, I want to simulate a real failure on this thing. And I thought that was kind of a novel way to do it. Now I've pulled the plug already. Now we've pulled the motherboard during a read write operation. And uh, just to give you some ideas of how things work, like I said, it's it's really neat to see that during a read write, losing a motherboard did not corrupt files. I can still go see all the files on it and actually pull some of those up over here. Open up a window for you and show you. So here's a whole bunch of video files I have from when I was just in New York. And uh, all the video files are perfectly fine. I can keep playing them and uh, watching videos and that while I'm, <laughs> you know, swapping motherboards on my enterprise NAS box. Like I said, this thing is very, very resilient on there. And this is kind of neat because now I can put the motherboard back in. Now, I, I have no idea because I'm doing this as I'm recording this. I have no idea what happens when you put a motherboard back in on these things uh, while it's on there. So that's that's a different experiment. You probably should turn it off, but um, let, let's keep the tests going because we want to make sure we're thorough on this. All right, after a short boot up time, I'm able to ping that device that was down, which was a 247. It's now back in standby mode. And we can see from here the uh, master backup, more frequent advertising received, maintain route, deletion failed interface. This is the internal interface when it noticed it failed, but this is the NTB interface. But now it's back up and running, which means these devices are back in sync. Now I still have a critical I haven't cleared. Well, actually, I just haven't refreshed the screen now that I clicked on it. You notice it's healthy, which means everything's back to normal and everything's working. Once again, I still have a file transfer running, and we'll show you the, in the background here. This is still working fine back here. The Windows box is able to open and do things. And all the drives are still showing healthy here without any issues at all. Everything's online. So you can not only remove a motherboard, you can replace and put in a motherboard here. I mean, granted, provided the configuration is the same. Uh, but I imagine in a failover situation, if you had to get a new motherboard in one of these if it failed, the people over at TrueNAS IX Systems would be able to ship you one out and you just copy the configuration files over from the live running one and copy them over to the other one and you can get this thing back up and running. Now, the last couple things, we showed removing a volume while it was working but it was just one of the regular volumes. So let me give you a breakdown of everything in here. Here is the Zill tank and here's the cache tank. Now, the difference is with Zill and cache. Let's talk about that for a second. Now, I'm not gonna read you the entirety of these articles, but first let's talk real quick about a uh, S-Log or Zill, how ZFS uses this and kind of a quick overview. So isn't Zill just ZFS name for a rate cache? a rate cache. So you kind of think of them as the same thing, but this causes some confusion understanding how it works and the best configure. First of all, Zill is more accurately referred to as a log whose main purpose is actually for data integrity. Now, this is kind of the details of the ZFS file system. And you, like I said, there's an entire, they break everything down about how this works. So here's our tank with Zill. There's the drive. So here's our RAID Z2. And here's the single drive we have dedicated to that. Now, because of the way ZFS works and we're dumping data to the Zill and then read write asynchronous, you worry, what if that one drive failed? Now, you can put these into their own RAID array, but this is obviously a single standalone drive. So let's just talk real quick of what happens if you lose that log. Now, this comes back to the way ZFS works and some of the details of the file system. But if you do lose this uh, Zill drive right here, obviously that seems concerning because there's only one of them. So let's go ahead and disconnect it. So the Hard drive with the Z sticker is the Zill drive. You can see all the active writing. And because of the way the Zill works, it only blinks a little compared to the rest of the drives in the Zill array, or as I call it, tank Zill. So all the other drives in there are blinking away, loading up the data, and you're only doing that in 
a couple logging so you get a blip here and there on that drive. Now once we eject it, you can see that the failure goes here. It says uh, the serial number of the drive was detached, the peripheral was destroyed, uh, kernel exited. So what it did was, going over here, we can see that the drive has been removed. Now we can replace it and put another drive in its place, but we do have a failure in degraded mode. But on the other side of that, we didn't end up with any file system corruption. Matter of fact, the delay happens almost instantaneously that it removes this drive. So there's really nothing going on here. So all of this working just fine over here and it's really none the wiser. Obviously the performance has been changed and we don't, we no longer have that Zill drive in there, but in from a functionality standpoint, the system is working perfectly fine. Our iSCSI attachments are the same. I can zip around through here, so we're none the wiser, and we can you know get a replacement drive on here. Now, one you know thing I mentioned before in the original review of TrueNAS is the ability for them to see this as well. So you can, if you have one of their higher levels of proactive support, and this is not turned on for this demo machine but it can actually alert them when a drive goes bad so they can get one ready for you. So if you're busy and not doing it, this system actually can notify the TrueNAS support engineers with your warranty and they can realize when a drive has failed or has a failure mode problem or maybe when you've yanked out a motherboard. So they're very active in this and able to do this, able to see it in real time, which is just a really cool uh, feature. So now we've degraded this one, but as you can see, no big deal, uh, everything stays up and running. So we've survived that level of fault tolerance as well. Now, the last thing we're gonna talk about here is the cache one. So cache drives work a little bit different, so let me explain those real quick. All right, so I pushed in the drive for the Zill drive and it's back in the system and it's back being happy. I cleared the error. You can see we are showing healthy. We look over here and no problem. Everything's, you know, back up and running like we wanted it to be. So now let's talk about caching and we've got that set up over here. So I moved from the Windows 10 one here. Let me force a shutdown. I don't feel like waiting for this. And I creatively named this one Windows 10 cache money volume. So this is a, another instance. I just duplicated it. And this is the true Nash cache volume. Same one here. Same storage device on the .249, but it's going to a different volume. And real quick, how I did that was services, go over to your iSCSI. This one is the cache volume. This is the Zill volume. This one's on tank Zill. This one's on tank cache. And when we look at our storage, tank Zill, tank cache. Pretty straightforward. So now I'm switched over to this tank cache one. And I got a bunch of data dumped to it. So this is L2 arc is your level two adaptive replacement cache. So once all the space in the arc is utilized in ZFS, CFS places the most recent and frequently used data in the level two adaptive cache. So what this is, is first you have your memory read cache that is obviously really fast, but you know, you can only put so much RAM in a device before that gets kind of pricey. So in between you can put an SSD. So all the frequently used files can kind of get migrated over to the SSD as an L2 arc. Now, when you're looking at FreeNAS and how that's set up, we go over here to the volume and here's the RAID volume itself and here's the cache. Now, this is a little tricky because getting all the data over there and you only have a gigabit connection to it, it's not gonna put a ton of data on there, but some of the data will go there, especially running like the iSCSI. So let's go over here. General storage, I'm gonna pull up my uh, NYC trip again. Find a big file. And if I open up a couple of these big files, this is just before I left. It was me and playing in a GoPro. We'll open up this one. So now I've opened up a few files. So some things should be pushed to cache. And of course, while this is running, I have the iSCSI running on the same drive. And what I'm doing here is showing you from the command line. Here's the pool called tank cache. Here's the cache drive. And uh, looks like we got about 272 gigs of data on there. And it's kind of reading back and forth. So sometimes we have a bunch of reads and writes going. Let's jump back over here to our iSCSI box. Go over to the console on this one.
Let's launch a couple things so as to do some more reading from that drive. And you can see the cache hits here, and now they're jumping up a little bit because we have a couple uh, reads and writes as it pulls data back and forth to and fro on the cache. Now, while it's doing this, let's eject the cache. All right, with the cache drive out, you see everything has now dropped to zeros on there. So let's see what's going on with our Windows box over here. Uh, I don't want to use Firefox as my default browser on this one. Let's Google some things for doing that. Let's uh, browse some files over here. Yeah, I can still open up all these folders. I can open up websites. So this uh, machine hasn't broke at all. Let's uh, go back and open up that video. Yep, that played reasonably flash. Opened up a new video out of there. Some of the other videos we had previously played. Now I'll pull you back over to here. I know I'm jumping on screens, but so still see no cache, all zeros here. Uh, the cache is just not working. So let's go back over to our free NAS box or our true NAS box. And you can see perf invalidated, stat task request, uh, it basically failed it out. Perf peripheral invalidated, peripheral destroyed. We have a critical to let me know that a hard drive was removed. The volume tank cache is online, but one or more device has been removed by the administrator. Sufficient replicas exist in a pool to continue functioning in a degraded state. Basically what it's letting you know is it failed, but it's okay because the system can keep working. So let's go back over to the volume status and there we can see that it's removed. Let me clear the air so I don't have a little red light anymore. So now the cache is missing. But as you noticed, we didn't miss a beat. We can still read and write to the drive. We did lose that fast cache from the L2 arc, but no big deal there because it'll rebuild itself and everything can go back to being happy at that point. You know, these things are, it, it removed these from the, it removed this from the tank cache. Uh, we lost that performance. We take a hit there, but the data lives on, the system moves on, and we didn't have any downtime, which of course is the most important thing with these because we all know in the real world, as much as we'd like all the hard drives to last forever, they don't. Uh, hard drives might get ejected you know, by someone walking by and touching it and someone putting their fingers on it, whatever may bad thing may occur, this thing has a incredible amount of fault tolerance to do it. So I've been really impressed overall with the performance of this, with the fault tolerance and just the system as a whole. It's been a real pleasure uh, working with it and loading up all these different uh, scenarios on it. So I give a big thumbs up to the people at TrueNAS. Like I said, they lent me this for this testing and review. And uh, they, so they were more than gracious, uh, but that really is influenced the decision. I already liked FreeNAS before. I liked TrueNAS just as much. Uh, but if you're looking for enterprise level, high grade server that will suffer through uh, some torture testing, this box is a good one to choose. I, I'm definitely really happy with it. All right, if you like the content here, like and subscribe. If you have, there's some more testing or some other questions you had about this where I can reach out to the FreeNAS team for you or you can tweet at them. They're very responsive. Uh, hopefully this review was helpful and I uh, gets you a better understanding of just how good this system is and how well it works to fault tolerance. All right, thanks for watching.